All right, here we go. So we're talking about deviations from the ideal gas law. And there are two important aspects of what we call the Van der Waals equation, which is how we actually um, adjust for the two major problems that uh, exist for gases that are real. We've learned that all gases have real gas behavior. Real gas behavior means essentially that gases attract each other. They take up space. Remember, an ideal gas, one that we can use in all of our gas law equations, whether it be PV equals NRT, PV over T equals PV over T, or molecular mass, dirt over P, or PM over RT if we're solving for density, or, or other equations like our kinetic molecular theory equations for root mean squared or for uh, molar kinetic energy, all are under the guidelines that the gases are behaving in a certain fashion. That certain fashion is that they are independent particles. For instance, if I've got these three particles and I increase the temperature, which is proportionate to kinetic energy, right? That means I have to add these guys or add energy to these guys because they are going to move randomly and in a straight line with a container wall, okay? Therefore, their number of collisions are going to increase in some way that we can calculate for them because of these straight line collisions. Or another way to think about it, if I had these three gas particles, and it's hard to have three, in a um, volume container that is not fixed, how much would it expand if I increased the temperature? I can calculate exactly. If every particle does their job and moves randomly with their kinetic energy okay, that is given to them, this will expand into a certain volume that we can expect. But, okay, but if they don't travel in straight line motions, if they're not random, if they are affected by the other gas particles, they won't do that. So we know that as good as the ideal gas law equation is, okay, in all the equations, we know that at room temperature, okay, there's a 5 to 10% deviation from what we calculate. There is some error, not based upon the experiment that we calculate them, there is error built into this equation. Remember, all the equations that we dealt with come from this one, okay, essentially, all right? So that with, is connected to all the equations that we've done, that we've worked with. And there's limitations. And we would say at, you know, normal conditions, which is basically STP, standard temperature and pressure, there's a 5% to 10% deviation, which means when I solve for the volume, solve for the pressure, solve for the temperature, I'm 5 to 10% off. There's an accuracy problem, okay? That's okay if we're sitting in the lab and trying to understand the relationship. It is not okay if you're an engineer trying to build in exactly how much pressure can exist in a certain boiler or a thrust engine, especially when the conditions are not STP, when the conditions are tremendously different, this percentage goes up. So when the conditions, like in the lab that we did, where we had five books on a syringe, there was tremendous amount of stress on the syringe. And of course, the stress on the syringe caused the problem, but the idea of making this volume or the pressure on top of this was so high that we caused even greater real conditions. So what are the real conditions? Okay, well, the real conditions mean that these gases don't go, don't go in straight lines. Students don't walk in straight lines. They're social beings. They're gonna walk toward their friends. They're going to take longer to get to class because they're going to walk with their friends, not say that I have to go to class. It's right there, okay? Got to get there first, say, hey, what's up? If they bounce into their friends, they're, going to, they're not going to go, eh, and keep going. They're not going to last. They're going to say, hey, well, I'm sorry. How's it going? Hey, okay, can I snap you? Whatever, but they're going to stick, not going to stick together. So the idea that we learned about these assumptions, and what are the assumptions? Number one. To be an ideal gas, to follow this directly, would mean number one, gases are random. Can I borrow a pencil? Like an st ideal student would be what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a student willing to give me a pencil. That is 
a focus, laser focus that I'm talking about that students have to have. This is an ideal student, okay? And I love, I love this student right here. So, so focused. She didn't get the joke. Okay, now, so this student is, 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 is right. now, that was perfect. So random, random students, random gases, okay, don't care about the other students behind them. They go in straight line motions. Two, their collisions are elastic. When they bounce into people, they bounce off. They're not what social, and they go back to their class. So the collisions are elastic. I can do this. Three is that normally these ideal gases go so fast, their own volumes, okay, are going to be tiny, the space they take up. And generally speaking, gases are going so fast, hundreds of miles an hour if you are a gas, the space they travel in is so big compared to their own size. That's why densities of gases are so small. So we say that their volume is insignificant. The ideal student tends to be a little smaller student. Okay, four. <laughs> no, uh, number four, probably the most important, these ideal gases, ideal students have no attractions for the people around them. And if they have no attractions, that's the reason, okay, they can go in straight line motions and get the worksheets without moving toward their friends. There's a fifth one and that's kinetic energy is proportionate to temperature. But we are focused, laser focused, on these two right here. These two postulates that explain the behavior of the perfect gas, the perfect student, which neither one exists. They might have some percentage of ideal behavior. Chess has friends, she is social, okay? So there's no perfect ideal gas either, which means there's gonna be some limitation here. We can correct for these, okay, these behaviors. So if you look up here, we have the ideal gas. Got to get to class. I don't care if there's a friend who might think I'm a friend. I'm getting there fast because I want to get my seat ready. He was like, what's up? <laughs> Yo, what's up? Yo, I'm going to snap you later. Bottom line is, and this is important, the ideal gas travels in shorter distances between their collisions. That's called a short mean free path. You should get that in your vocabulary. The gases that attract each other, okay, are going to travel a longer distance between collisions. Therefore, their mean free path is longer between collisions. And that's the reason why, and this is important, when we measure the pressure of a real gas, it is always going to be lower than that of an ideal gas. Or better yet, if I was to use this formula and predict the pressure, I would predict always with this form formula a higher pressure than actually exists. This formula, if I solve for P under the correct conditions, I'm going to have a pressure that's 5% or 10% bigger than what it actually is because what it actually does is attract somewhat. So this is going to overestimate what the real pressure is if I use this formula. Hey, in lab, the things that we do in high school, it's fine. But if you're trying to know exactly what the pressure is, for whatever reason that you need it in industry or chemical engineering, not good enough. Not good enough, especially when the conditions get more strenuous and that percentages go up. All right, so that's important. All right, so that's the one problem is that we have pressure is going to be elevated by this formula than it actually is because of the attractive forces that all gases. Now, if some gases are what? More ideal, lighter, faster, like a helium, this deviation will be small, okay? So it's important you realize that. So moving on, okay? And we know these deviations exist because we know that volume and temperature are proportionate. This is, of course, Kelvin temperature. At some point, all right, we should know that the volume should go down to zero if they that's kind of weird. We know this relationship just can't go down to zero. At some point, as the temperature drops, gases condense into liquids. Liquids have far, far, far smaller volumes for the same mass than a what? A gas. By definition, a gas always fills its container. The story I always talk about is that my son had a party, okay, 
uh, the one that's on Snapchat, I guess, okay, had a party, and I returned a helium tank that we blew a bunch of balloons. Okay, there was no huffing there, all right? We didn't do any Graham's Law Fusion demos, all right? Um, but we, I returned a tank. Now, the tank had no helium left, but the guy asked me, is it empty? I'm like, no. Okay, then he grabbed the tank and yelled at me, and he saw there was no helium. He's like, it's, you know, he didn't like the idea that there could have been, what, one helium bouncing around? So gases always either. fill their container, even if it's just Can one particle that? flying around. But when it know. becomes a liquid, a liquid yeah. takes up a volume too, but far smaller. A liquid doesn't always fill the container. That's important. So in any case, this is going to come down. Okay, if this was what? Like I did crush the can yesterday. I had this filled up with water vapor, inverted it, put it, oops, okay, put it on uh, um, ice, it crushed because you made a partial vacuum. Why? The water vapor at zero degrees Celsius condensed into liquid droplets. So what was keeping the pressure equal on the inside to the outside was the water vapor pressure. When I inverted and cooled it, the water immediately, because of high attractive forces for water, became a liquid droplet and there was no more pressure left in here. And atmospheric pressure crushed it. If it was oxygen, it would come down negative 186 or something, negative 196. Okay, so all, all gases will condense, okay? Except for hydrogen. That's got a, a little problem because of repulsive forces. So there's no such thing as a gas that's gonna just get colder and colder. Of course, I'm gonna strip on my water there. Who put that there? Me. Okay, so moving on. Party people. All right, this is a demo I'm gonna do in class, but this is a demo where I drop liquid nitrogen on this, uh, on this, um, me, uh, me, this Gauss meter, and it's measuring around 14.7 pounds per square inch at a current temperature. And then I drop in liquid nitrogen and it goes down and I see what I calculate for. So we calculate for the new pressure, what we expect at negative 196. And I guess you can probably guess what? The pressure that we calculate for using the ideal gas law formula will be higher or lower? Higher. higher. It's gonna be higher because we're assuming that there's gonna be no attractive forces. The mean free paths will be what? Shorter, correct. Therefore, more collisions per particle, and that's why you should get a higher pressure. We should actually read a lower pressure. And why? Because I've got air. There's a little sphere here. Or I can't say ball in high school. There's a sphere here, and that sphere has nitrogen and oxygen. Well, oxygen actually condenses into a liquid. I'm going to try that today in class, too. So some of it became a liquid, so this should be lower than expected. And we can try that for fun. All right, but that's not the point of this um, lecture. Okay, so any case, moving on, let's go to a corrective type of an equation called the Van der Waals equation. Now, the Van der Waals equation was an equation <laughs> that, pretty random, right? Okay, well, yeah. just like, <laughs> just like, just like real gases, that. sorry. <laughs> All right, fine, I've had. So the Van der Waals equation, and here, uh, here's part of it in all of its glory, there are two parts. This is PV equals nRT. Okay, so the Van der Waal equation is an equation where we try to correct for the two problematic um, parts of the uh, formula. Let's, try, let's go, go forward and go backwards here. So there it is in its glory here. So it should be PV equals nRT, and what we do is we have some corrections here. These corrections help us make the gases that are acting real and then make them what? Act ideal to put them in. There's two ways to look for it. But bottom line, Johannes van der Waals created an equation in the 1870s to fix this ideal gas law behavior so that there would not be any deviation. This is what chemical engineers use. Okay, because they know no gas is truly ideal, and they knew they have to come up with real values. So these are the corrections. But let me try to explain what they are. Number one, we talk about pressure. Let's start with pressure. Pressure we know is going to be decreased because there's attractive forces, therefore their mean free paths are longer. Okay, so why we know it's decreased? So if I wanted to put in the pressure value, let's say I measured a pressure with some meter, and I don't have that meter out, so and I have a pressure. I know that pressure, okay, 
is going to be lower than it's supposed to be based upon the formula. So if I take a real gas, they're all real, okay, and I read it from a pressure gauge, I know it's lower than it's supposed to be. So to put this into the ideal equation, I want to correct it for ideal behavior. So what we do is this factor, this is a constant called A, and then A is a factor for um, attractive forces. And notice it's times mole squared over volume squared. Why is volume part? Because we know that volume and pressure are inversely related. So we have to know the space they're flowing in and how many particles to make this accountable. But the point is, A is an attractive force, okay? And if things have higher attractive forces, they have a greater factor. Now, what are we doing here? We're going to add to the pressure that I read from a meter. We're going to add back the pressure it's supposed to be. That's what they do here. So if I've got a pressure reading or, I can, or, or I've got something and I'm going to put it into this formula, the ideal formula, I'm going to give it back the pressure it's supposed to have. And that's why I'm adding back the pressure here. Okay, but the amazing part about Van der Waals is that he was able in the 1870s figure this out and then take what? Pure form of a bunch of gases to figure out what those constants would be. You need to know what these constants stand for, how well they attract. Look at helium. It's a nonpolar gas and it's small. The smallest attractive force. That's why helium is very, 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 okay, least, I should say it's the least ideal gas on this list because the attractive forces are smaller, but it still has some, okay? O2 jumps up, ammonia jumps through the roof. Why? Why does ammonia jump through the roof? Polar. It's polar. Anytime you see these A constants jump through the roof, look, this is 32 grams per mole. This is 17. Whoa, this is half as what? Half as heavy. Doesn't this going to, this is going much faster, right? So you would think NH3, based on what I've taught you, being lighter would go faster and act what? More ideally than O2. Remember, 17 grams per mole, 32. This is lighter. It should go faster, therefore not attract. When you consider the fact that ammonia is polar, okay, that's the reason why this jumps up, because polar means you have a positive end and a negative end, and that's going to stick together strongly, more strongly than something that's nonpolar. We'll talk about the nonpolar attractions called LDFs. They do stick together. But listen, oxygen has a boiling point of negative 186 or 183. This has got a boiling point, I think, about 60. Much difference. Why is the boiling point higher? Because these liquids, when they're a liquid, stick together. The attractive forces are greater between ammonia. Look at water. It's 18 grams per mole. And it's even higher. Water is even more polar. Why? O is more electronegative than, ammonia, than N. So therefore, there's a, there's a greater rich negative area. Okay? And then boom. Methane is 16 grams per mole. Very similar to these three, right? But look at its attractive force factor. It's nonpolar. Okay? All right, so important to understand that, especially for your test there. But bottom line, I'm adding it back to the pressure because the pressure that I read is undervalued. I want to make it what, would it, what would it be if it was what? Ideal. Okay, what's the other factor? We haven't talked about it. The other factor is volume, okay? And as I said yesterday, and I will say today, we consider gases to have no volume. This usually doesn't give us a problem because the size of gas molecules are tiny and the gas densities are so gosh darn small. They're spread out. How many grams was in a 500 of air? Remember that lab we did grams of air in a uh, uh, milliliter or in a 500 milliliter container? Would you guys get like 0.6 grams of air or something? I, I think it was something small, okay? Yeah, it makes sense because I think the density of air is like 1.17 grams per liter, okay? 1.17 grams per liter. It's not a lot because it's spread out. So where does this come to play? Well, normally the volume problems come to play when you have extreme changes in pressure. Why? Well, if you uh, have a piston, and I guess chemistry teachers love pistons, so we always draw them, all right? So we have a piston that comes down. Now, right now, this piston that I drew these gases are spread out pretty far apart. And knowing their volume isn't going to really significantly change the total volume. Remember, 
The volume that we actually calculate for in PV equals NRT is actually the space the gas is flying. It does not consider the space the gases take up. So when you think about it, don't gas molecules take up some space? So think about this for me. The volume that we calculated for is always going to be undervalued for what it really is because it's not considering the space. Normally, it's never a problem, except in these extreme pressure conditions. If I make this, make this uh, piston come down farther, where the pressure really increases, just like our syringe lab, and now I have these molecules taking up some space here. In this extreme condition, we would say the volume that's left in this syringe, I know this is pretty extreme, 50% is due to the what? Space the molecules take up. Can never go to zero volume. Why? Because the molecules take up space. But in this condition, as this pushes down, the fraction of volume the molecules take up become a bigger fraction of the overall volume. What I mean by that is, if I was to measure, and this is an absurd number, okay, for this, but if I was to measure 10 milliliters of space right here, okay, this would measure using PV as NRT. If I solve for V, I would be measuring something that is what? Less or more? Less. If the volume is 10 milliliters, and I calculated based upon pressure, temperature, volume, use this, put all the values in, and I solve for volume. So using the pressure, knowing the R, knowing the moles, knowing the temperature, I measured 10 from the experiment. Assuming no error in the experiment, of course, okay, what would the volume be if I use this? Higher or lower? Lower. It's only going to, it's going to measure five milliliters. It's only going to measure the space that doesn't, that, 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 that they fly in, not the space that they occupy. Right. So what I'm telling you is that the problems here are when it comes to volume, we're going to solve for a lower, it's going to calculate a lower volume. A lower volume is not considering the space the molecules take up. Now, normally it's not a problem, except on extreme pressure conditions. So for already people, what do we do to correct for it? If I measure a volume, okay, okay, the volume I measure is considering the molecules and the space they're flying in. To correct for real gas behavior, subtract you subtract by some factor. Now, the B constant that Van, Johannes van der Waals came up with is not there, so let's bring it there, is based upon just size. Okay, so there we go. And I guess we'll put it there. So this B factor is based on size. So notice helium is the smallest. This is totally based on size. Look at O2 and NH3, very similar. Look at H2O, very similar. Look at these guys. These guys are getting bigger because they're bigger molecules, more atoms. So this is totally based on size. So again, if you look at this, we're going to subtract out the extra volume that you measure because atoms take up space. Look for pressure. We're going to add back a factor of pressure that should be there, but we measure a lower pressure. To, get, to make it a real condition, we add back the pressure to consider for the fact that they don't have attractive forces. Here we take away the space they actually take up, okay? So to understand this clearer, let's just put stuff on the board here, okay? So we talk with pressure. So we're doing pressure first. So let's do pressure. And let's do volume. You have to understand this. I think this is a nice way of thinking about it. This is what we measure. And this, of course, would be what? real. This is what we calculate for. And this, of course, would be what? Ideal. Ideal. Okay, so in real gas behavior, we're going to measure a, compared to the calculated value. So if we measure a, a, a pressure in lab, that value is going to be what? Overestimated or underestimated compared to the calculator. And you measure. Under. It's going to be under. So the measured value is going to be lower. Of course, why? Because there are attractive forces. It's a real condition. There are attractive forces. 
The mean free paths are longer. Molecules are moving in curved pathways. The calculated one is what? Higher. Is higher. Because we're what? Assuming no attractions. Right. Now you're understanding. This one is flipped. Different color. Okay. So real condition. All right. The volume is going to be overestimated. Right. And why? Because the gases do have volume. Do have volume. They do take up space. So the volume that you measure is the space plus their own volume. Okay? And of course, volume that you calculate, that you solve for, is going to be what? Lower, because you're going to assume what? There is, no there, is, there is no volume. Okay? It's one way to look at it. All right? Very important that you understand that. Okay? So, case in point, let's think about a scenario. Let's say I collected a gas by water displacement. Okay, and let's pretend that water is red because that's all I got here. Okay, now, to do stoichiometry, I want moles, don't I? Right, so what do I do? I solve for pressure. Now we know in this case that I have to subtract out the height of column of water. Then I gotta subtract out the what? Oh, I gotta figure out the pressure due to what? The pressure of the atmosphere minus the height of that in mercury, right? Divide by 13.6, we do that, right? Okay, then we would subtract the water vapor for a certain temperature, and now we'd have what? We'd have the pressure due to, let's say, the butane. Now I want moles. Okay, what's mole equal? N is equal to what? PV over what? RT. RT. Now, Solving for moles. Do you think your moles are going to be overestimated or underestimated using PV? I'm going to solve for moles because once I have moles of butane, then I can do stoichiometry if this was a reaction that produced butane, right? So is my mole over or underestimated? Well, we're assuming if I blow this up, okay, these gases are independent particles. Yes? And they're going in straight line motions, and they have long, mean, or sorry, short, mean, free paths. Okay, now, I measure the pressure. Okay? Is that pressure overestimated or underestimated? Over I measured, I measured a pressure. Okay? So I measured a pressure. All right? You think about that for a second. Um, so the pressure that I have by figuring out, okay, space, okay, is always going to be a lower because there are attractive forces. All right? Now, but I measured, if I take P in and solve it like this, I'm going to get some value of moles because these guys are really attracting. Isn't there, okay, let's, let's, let's stop for a second. I'm solving for moles. I'm assuming this relationship. I'm assuming that these gas molecules are acting ideally, correct? Now, I measured a pressure, fine, but the pressure pushing up against the atmosphere, okay, is probably something I can probably stay with, right? Now, here's the deal. The moles inside, because they're acting what? Because they're acting like real gases and are attracting, isn't there going to be need for more of them to exert the same pressure? Yeah. So in this case here, when you think about it, when I solve for moles, I'm assuming the pressure that I read okay, by comparing with the atmosphere, okay, is pretty solid here. I'm not using a pressure gauge, I'm comparing it. But that pressure pushing down against the atmosphere, okay, needs 
more gas molecules to exert that pressure, correct? Because they're attracting. So what you solve for in moles is going to be a what? Underestimate. That's a way to think about this. You need more of these, okay, to create the pressure to fight against the atmosphere to keep that water up because they're attracting. So, and if they're attracting, isn't there a little more dense? So your measurement for moles is gonna be undervalued. There's a little bit more there. That's one way to think about in terms of the attractive forces. Does that have to do with the pressure though? Well, I would say in the way that I measured this, the pressure is the pressure. Since I'm gonna measure the pressure by the atmospheric pressure that I know, and how much water it's pushing back in the manometer and the vapor pressure, in this instance, I would say the pressure is true. I'm solid on the pressure. I'm not, I don't have this scenario. I know I started that way, but in this scenario, the pressure is what it is. But that pressure is being created, needs to be created with more gas molecules if they're what? Attracting. So when I solve for N, I'm gonna get an undervaluement. That pressure to push against the water, okay, to have this level here, requires more gas molecules, more collisions, because they are not moving in straight line motions. So you'll get a value, but that's gonna be underrepresented. One way to think about this, okay? All right, take a break.